Are we live? All right. So my name is in, indeed Adam Helinski. I come indeed from Belgium, which is a tiny country lost in Europe. And um, one of the reasons why I came here, and probably why you came, why we like Clodger so much, is because it's such a versatile language. It's good, but not excellent for a whole variety of, of uh, topics, use cases, and domains. And even for those domains when, where it can feel less adequate, I'm used to say that Clodger is a bit like pizza. Even when it's bad, it's still pretty good, right? However, a few years ago, I noticed that one domain was being missing, or at least late to the party. And I'm talking here about IoT. Yeah? Is it better? All right. So yeah, I'm talking here about IoT and especially anything related to hardware. And the thing is, for once, Java, the Java ecosystem, doesn't help us here. Because if you look at Java libraries for interfacing with hardware, they tend to be often limited, old, not really maintained. But anyway, in spite of that, I got curious and I've started wondering, could we use Clodger to build any kind of smart, connected devices? When you start reading about IoT, your head will start spinning because there are so many different kinds of devices. So thinking in terms of broad categories, first of all, we have those really tiny, small devices. And uh, they tend to be based on microcontrollers mainly. Not only, but mainly. And they are really constrained because they are rather to meant do to IO tasks. So they are not really meant to do any kind of complex logic or complex data processing or that, store, that kind of stuff. And um, Arduinos are a common example of boards built on microcontrollers. Sometimes they just have a few kilobytes of RAM, which is, of course, challenging if you want to run a GVM, right? If we take a more capable example, like the ESP32, it's clocked at 240 megahertz. It has 520 kilobytes of RAM. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, right? But uh, for that kind of devices, it's really decent. And so when you start a discussion about running Clodger on something like this, it can go either way. First of all, there's someone, there's always someone to tell you that you can just use another Lisp. For example, I've heard about Ferret, which is a, a Lisp akin to Clodger. I mean, the syntax looks a bit like Clodger, but it's being compiled to C++ 11, which means that you, ta you can target that sort of, of stuff. But the thing is, it's not closure, so it defies the purpose of this talk today. So a better sounding compromise might be to use closure script, because some of those devices, like the ESP32, can run JavaScript, and so you can guess where this is going. Now, as it turns out, Mike Fikes, the core maintainer of Clojure Script has been doing some experiments. And so did Philip Mayer. He talked about it just a bit at the Conj in 2019. And essentially, from the few bits of information I've grasped, it's tedious. It's really experimental. Because you have to add a module in order to have extra RAM. It takes like half, half an hour to flash a program, to, to send it to the device. And uh, sometimes it's not even really stable. So obviously, I cannot really recommend it, right? So yeah, Clodger and not even Clodger script are, is an option for microcontrollers. But I'm not too bitter about it, because the kind of programs you would write for such devices are rather simple, in the sense that they are often sequential, single-threaded. As I said, they do not involve a lot of really hardcore computation or data man manipulation. So although having closure would be nice, certainly, it doesn't feel like such a requirement. So let's go to something a bit more powerful, things that are based on microprocessors. And especially all those single boards, computers, all those ARM devices, like the Raspberry Pi, for instance. It's clocked at 1.4 gigahertz, one gigabyte of RAM, model three, which isn't even the latest one. So it, it's a whole different universe, right? And so spec-wise, of course you can run Clodger, but should you? <laughs> so I'm gonna talk quite a bit about this. 
let's give it a go. What do you have to do to run a closure on an ARM device? And I have here a Raspberry Pi, it's hidden, but, but I have one, which will serve as a prime example for ARM devices in general. So the first thing you have to do, obviously, is to install a GVM. This hasn't been always the most straightforward thing to do because uh, OpenGDK wasn't and still isn't, I believe, optimized for ARM devices. At some point, Oracle dropped support and um, it was a bit messy. So what you can do these days, very simply, is to install Zulu Embedded by Azul Systems. It's a GVM meant for IoT, so it is optimized for ARM. If you have a Raspberry Pi, you can even download the hard float um, version. It's top notch. It's open source, it's based on OpenGDK, and it's free, like free beer in the sense that it's free to use. And they have a clear licensing about it. They even provide commercial support if you need it. So yeah, from what I know, it's the most straightforward option you have these days. And because we are running Linux, you just install it like on any Linux system. So it's really easy, actually. And the same kind of comments apply to installing Clojure. Since it is Linux, you do what you usually do on Linux, and you can install Line again, boot, uh, Clojure CLI, tool devs, all that, and it just works. Now, when it comes to using all of that, things are a bit different than a desktop computer, at least. For instance, starting a, a REPL, just a bare REPL using Clojure CLI, can take up to 10 seconds. So startup time is already a bit of a pain on a desktop, and here it's even worse. And if you start requiring namespaces and compiling stuff on the go, then, yeah, it degrades in the sense that suddenly starting can take 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40, maybe even a minute or so. So yeah. However, for development, it's not really that cumbersome because you just put a REPL once in a while and, and then we're good to go. And uh, for production, or anything more serious at least, you can always use ahead of time compilation. It helps to some extent. What I really hope for is that one day, GraalVM will work on ARM de de devices because then you can, uh, for instance, create um, a native image of your application and you don't have that kind of problems. It just starts in milliseconds. Uh, but I wouldn't, you know, don't hold your breath. And uh, since we are running Linux here, well, it's good, first of all, because Linux is massively used everywhere, and IoT is definitely no exception to that. And here today, we are on a quest for writing portable code. So it is true we are targeting one specific operating system, that's Linux, but we want our code to be portable across architectures and chips. We don't want, at least I don't want, to be rewriting whole parts of my code every time I have to change a device or use another, another chip. So portability. Having, having taken care of all that, we can dive into the hardcore stuff hardware and doing I.O. And the elephant in the room here is GPIO, General Purpose Input Output. When you look at the connector pins on a Raspberry Pi, this is what you are looking at. Those are digital pins. Simplifying a bit, they can either be on, that is high, or low, that, that would be off. And you, the user, can decide whether a given pin is an input, you can connect a button to it, for example, or an output. And you could connect an LED or a relay or any kind of actuator, really. GPIO will be the one example where we'll dive into the details. Because I want you to have at least one example where it's not only about how to use that, that kind of stuff, but also developing an, an intuition about how it works under the hood. What does it take? What are the challenges? to do that kind of stuff using Clojure. So here I have an, an LED. It's connected to pin number 17 on my Raspberry Pi here. And I'd like you to simply turn it on. But you have to start from scratch, all right? So what you would have to do is to know what kind of chip you're programming. Then you would have to read the data sheet. You would go to the GPIO section 
and you'd read pages and pages of stuff like that. Uh, those are essentially descriptions of specific addresses in memory, in physical memory, where you would read or write some special values for doing stuff like, well, here is pin number 17, I want to declare it as an output, and I want to turn it on. It doesn't sound that complex at first, maybe, you know, just doing some operations in memory, but if you look at everything that a GPIO pin, a single pin can do, then it's probably more complex that, than you would imagine at first. And in practice, what you would have to do is gain root access to dev mem. Now, dev mem on a Linux system is the layout of physical memory, right? And having a root access to, to this specifically, it's a bit like having God mode, you know? You're powerful, so to say. And just this makes me a bit anxious to have that kind of power in a user application connected to the internet. Could be dangerous, right? And the kind of code you write is very much low level. And that's not, not a problem. If that's what you like to do, then all right. But uh, it's definitely not portable since you are targeting one specific chip. And there are some other caveats. For example, there is no sense of ownership, no sense of locking. So two processes could use the same pin unwillingly, and that would lead to corruption and all sorts of bugs. And even more importantly, you have no automatic cleanup. So say, for example, that you have a motor connected to a pin, and you turn it on, it starts spinning, but suddenly your process crashes. Well, guess what? The motor keeps spinning until someone or something turns it off explicitly. I can imagine how that could be dangerous, right? So that kind of operations should be taken care of by the operating system or the kernel or anything lower than the user application that you're writing. But in practice, people do not really care. If you look at um, the kind of libraries that we use, for example, for Raspberry Pis, the native ones like Wiring Pi or Pi GPIO, that's what they do under the hood, those dangerous operations on DevMem. And Pi4j, which is a common Java library, actually uses Wiring Pi. So even those wrappers in higher level languages, this is what they do under the hood. So they provide convenience over shaky foundations. Maybe Linux can help us. For a whole while, we had the file system API. I won't talk about it because <laughs> essentially it was so bad it got deprecated. The only reason I mention it is so that you know that you shouldn't be using it because some libraries, and especially some Java libraries, do rely on this file system API, so stay off that road. What you should be using is the so-called new API which appeared a couple of years ago, but a couple of years later, it's still not widely known. But if you look at it, it's fast, it has a good design in my opinion, it provides the kind of functional functionalities that you need, like locking, automatic cleanup, and um, interrupts, I'll talk about those in, in a minute or so. It's re really good, and this is what I advise. But then you have to be able to talk to it, to use it. So here, we are, we are not relying on a library, we are relying on something that is already embedded in Linux, so to say. So we don't have really native dependencies, which is a good thing. And then we can use GNA, Java Native Access, which is a method for calling native code. And it's pretty neat because you don't have to write any kind of native code. All the glue code, all the bindings you, you write, or in Java, and then in just a matter of using those bindings from Clojure. I guess you'd like to see now how it works in practice, right? Yeah? Okay. So, lucky us, I wrote some bindings and uh, a wrapper as well. So, if we switch over there, we can use developed GPIO to do some GPIO operations. So first of all, you have to acquire a GPIO device. 
This will be our driver, so to say. This will take care of those lower level operations <clears throat> for us. And uh, they're located on dev, GPIO chip, and I know here it's number zero. And uh, once you have this GPIO device, the kind of I.O. you do with those GPIO lines is very similar to just handling a file. So, remember I have an, an LED here, all right? It's connected to pin number 17. I want to be able to handle that, so I'm requesting a GPIO handle. For pin 17, it will be an output, and uh, just for fun, I want it to turn on as soon as I acquire the handle. So, it is off. And hopefully, I've been having some issues, but it should work indeed. So that's a good start for sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now I have this handle, and just like writing to a file, you'd need some kind of, of uh, byte array to write bytes, right? Here we have a buffer, which will represent the state that we are handling here. That is the state of the spin. And now I can write this kind of function, turn LED on or off. What it does, essentially, it takes the, the buffer and it changes the state of this LED in the buffer, and then we write it here using our handle. So if I compile this function, I can now use it. Turn LED false, and just like a magic trick, <laughs> it seems to work. <laughs> or turn LED true, and there we go. So, thanks. <laughs> what I want you to notice is that in comparison or in comparison to this uh, lower level stuff I was talking about earlier, it's very dense, you know, it's closer, it works in a very straightforward manner, and it's really easy. And more importantly, you have this instant feedback loop because you're working under REPL, and when you work with hardware, it's really interesting to have, to have this uh, uh, instant feedback, right? Now, what you will often need to do is to have some sorts of interrupts. So when you have an input, like a button for instance, an interrupt will call some code when the, the state of this button changes. Here we have a watcher, it's kind of similar. It's a watcher for pin number 22 because I have here a, a press button connected, uh, a push button I mean connected to pin 22. It's an input, I can compile it. And then I can block for an event. And now I'm just waiting, or the device is waiting. If I press the button, we have an event. So, a second, I'll do it again. All right, if I press the button, Maybe it's not connected right, or I'm having some... Issues. Oh yeah, right. I wasn't blocking actually. So... Yeah, essentially what you have to notice here is that um, you, you get three things, basically. Um, what happened? So here my button, um, the, the, the signal of my button ch changed, essentially. I know when it happened, and I know that the edge was falling. So when you press the button, the voltage rise from zero to five volts, and then when you unpress it, the edge is falling, it goes from five to zero volts, essentially. 
And then you can do all sorts of crazy stuff uh, because uh, inputs are, of course, very common in any kind of, of projects. Okay. So, you can do plenty of stuff using GPIO. I really encourage you to read more about this. Um, it's like the, the one thing you learn when you start doing that sort of things, right? But what is very common as well is talking to other machines, like sensors, for example. And uh, for that, we have formal protocols. A lot of those devices, like the Raspberry Pi or microcontrollers or other ARM devices, have hardware support for I squared C, which is a very simple bus protocol. It uses two pins, and it's rather meant for exchanging small amount of data, which is fine when you talk with sensors because sometimes you just you know, need to, to read a couple of bytes, for instance. And it's widely used. It's kind of a de facto standard, but not all devices implement all I2C functionalities. So it would be nice to have a REPL in order to you know, uh, test how, how, they behave, how they behave and see you know, what kind of functionalities they do support. And so there is a Linux API for that. I wrote some bindings and I wrote a closure wrapper. But being able to talk to a device is rather easy. The next step is being able to understand it. So here, as an example, I have a BME 280 sensor. It's just a, a tiny, tiny triple sensor. It measures the temperature, the atmospheric pressure, and humidity levels. And so in order to understand what I can do with it, I would have to read the data sheet and look for that kind of information. So when you use I2C, the first byte you send, you write, is always a command, so to say. So for example here, in order to write some configuration to this uh, sensor I have here, I would need to send first F5 in hexadecimal. And then I would write another byte, which would be indeed the configuration, for example, lowering, um, lowering the details so that it consumes less power, that sort of stuff. For uh, consuming data, I would first, for example, send FE in hexadecimal and read a couple of bytes in order to have data about humidity levels, that sort of stuff. So it's uh, a bit low level, but it's manageable. It's rather easy to understand. I mean, those data sheets are meant to be rather friendly most of the time. And uh, it's a nice experience because, I, as I was saying, you're at REPL, you're testing this device, you can see how it behaves. You follow the, the data sheet and you start writing all of that in a namespace, functions, um, all those uh, commands and that sort of stuff. You do that gradually, you can test it, you can see it working, and suddenly you have kind of a library, right? And so that's what I have here. Just to have a rough idea of uh, how you would talk to such a sensor, let me check if it's on. Just in case. Oh, it's here actually. I'm only having hardware issues today. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. If I do, just a second. Is it done? All right, sorry. Sometimes I have connectivity issues. Uh, I think the hardware suffered a bit when I was traveling. So, should be fine. What I have to do, of course, is to open an I2C bus. Here on my Raspberry Pi, I know it's located under dev I2C number one. And uh, because it's a bus, there could be several devices, I have to select the one sensor I'm interested in. 
and I know it has uh, this address in hexadecimal 77. I select this um, sensor, and then without going too much into the details, I do write some configuration, I wait a bit, and then I can read the data, and I can even read some calibration data. Because you see, when you manufacture sensors, they tend to behave slightly differently because of the manufacturing process. So good manufacturers will embed some data, like compensation words, that you can use then to adjust the raw values you get. It's always good to know. And so if I evaluate, It does write a configuration, it waits for a little while, and once again, am I stuck? I'm having really weird issues today. I don't know why it was working perfectly fine in the morning. All right, well, I'll show you a demonstration later, <laughs> obviously. Okay, well, sorry about that. When you have more data to, um, to exchange, then URT is more convenient. Sometimes it's called a V serial port, but actually it's more accurate to say that it's rather meant to implement some serial ports. And so many devices have uh, hardware support for it. That is a um, hardware interface, a pair of, uh, of pins like RXTX that you can use. And uh, a common gateway is to use USB because USB stands for universal serial port. And uh, a common a Java library for doing that sort of stuff is RxTx. And um, <clears throat> I just wrote a very simple closure wrapper for it. And I'd like to give it a go. I'm not lucky today, but who knows? If I try to open a serial port, it's happening. Yeah, there's something wrong with the class path. path. I'm not sure why. Okay. Moving on, no worries. But it's a very convenient method to exchange any amount of, of um, data you have. Um, and so it's commonly used, for example, to talk to LCD screens or other microcontrollers and that sort of stuff. And then there are plenty of stuff I could talk about, like SPI or PWM, analog IO. So instead, I'd like to give you some tips how you can proceed if you want to use anything else. So SPI, for instance, is a common protocol, a bit like I2C, and there is a user API for it. So if you need to use it, you can write some bindings, like I did for I2C. Now, it's a bit of work, but you did it once, and you're good to go, and you would be doing everybody a favor. So why not? Another option would be to use just something else. For example, the, the sensor I have here has both I2C and SPI, depending on what I'm using. Actually, what pins I'm using, I mean. So here I picked I2C, obviously, because I had a library for it. And when you don't have hardware support, for example, here on my Raspberry Pi, I don't have any analog pins, then you can always offload the work to something else, like a microcontroller, say an Arduino, who has some um, analog pins, and then they could use um, URT or I2C and uh, talk to my Raspberry Pi for example. Or uh, you can use a converter. There are many converters. Uh, for, for example, you probably have never heard about Metabus. It's a very specific European protocol. It's a standard for talking to things like electricity meters or gas meters. So it is very specific indeed. I didn't have hardware support for it on my Raspberry Pi, so what I did, I just grabbed a converter, Metabus to URT, and then to me, it was just like a serial port. 
And then I was able to find a library for understanding the Metabus protocol, the data format, and it was really easy to use this specific, seldom encountered protocol. There are converters for, for example, I2C to, to USB so that you can use it on your laptop. You will probably always be able to find a converter to your likings. And then, when it comes to LAN, WAN, the, the internet, and all that, there's not much to say because we are running Clojure, right? So it's the ecosystem you already like and love. So you can use WebSockets, for, for example. A few words I should uh, say about MQTT. It's a very common protocol for um, the Internet of Things. It's commonly used, but it's not that widely known besides IoT. And you see, when you build smarter things, you often need bidirectional communication. So you could use WebSockets, right? But then you would usually implement a lot of functionalities on top of raw WebSockets. And uh, most of the time, MQTT will provide you what you need. For example, the data is organized following a pub sub pattern around topics. It's always very convenient. You can have different uh, guarantees when it comes to delivering messages. Um, you can even write a will, so to say, so that when a device connects, can register a message that we will get dispatched to a specific topic only when it gets disconnected. Ungracefully, I mean. And uh, MQTT is very well supported in the cloud, Azure, AWS. Um, so no trouble when it comes to using it in the grand scheme of things. And it's browser friendly because MQTT also works over WebSockets. And it's also always uh, commonly su supported by MQTT brokers. So I encourage you to read a bit more about MQTT, even for regular web development, because as I said, very often it will give you it will give you what you need. And there are a couple of Clojure libraries for MQTT version 3, so no trouble for using it. Now, it's true that uh, I talked a lot about ARM devices, but IoT is not at all about small stuff. Now you can go pretty big. Actually, these days, iIoT is really popular industrial Internet of Things. But uh, decades ago already, even in the 90s, in the 80s, we were talking about SCADA. And it was, it was already IIoT, industrial IoT. So there is nothing new to some extent when it comes to building, for example, smarter factories and trying to, uh, well, to have things like remote access. And so just to give you a hint, imagine you're building a factory, right? You need reliable, time-sensitive automation. All those assembly lines, plenty of stuff going on. And so for that, you would often use PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. Those are kind of robust microcontrollers. They are meant uh, to do I.O. rather than complex data manipulation. And um, they are meant to work under more extreme conditions more extreme temperatures, humidity variations, they have to be resistant against electromagnetic noise, that sort of stuff. They come in all sorts of shapes and form, and they're widely used. But they don't work alone. They are not meant to be connected to the internet, but they are meant to work together locally. And in order to communicate, they often use Modbus, which is an old protocol, it's aging, but it's widely used. And the data format is rather simple. Basically, it's a bit like I2C. You specify a command, so to say, or a function, as it's called here, and you can read some inputs, write some outputs, analog ones, digital ones, you know, read and write some variables. And this data format is implemented, physically speaking, over different mediums, like Modbus over TCP IP. This one is very convenient because you can assign an IP address to your PLCs, you connect them to a local network using Ethernet, for example, and then they can talk together. But the thing is, you can plug to this network any kind of computer you desire, and it can run a Clojure, and there are a couple of Java libraries understanding Monbus. 
And so why am I talking about closure in this context? Well, imagine you're building this factory of yours. Can you think of any convenient language for handling plenty of those PNCs, like hundreds, maybe even thousands, who knows? Often concurrently, because there are a lot of stuff going on at once, at one given point in time in a factory. Lots of data to process, and you want this factory to be smart. So you want to connect this local network to the external world, to the cloud, to databases. You want to be able to build some data, some dashboards, uh, to have some remote access, to store data for doing all sorts of uh, processing and, uh, and analytics. And so when it comes to that kind of complexity, I don't know about you, but uh, I would use Clojure personally. So obviously there is a few things you would have to do in addition in order to build a factory, but it's a useful hint to have. So summarizing our journey today, we went from tiny to huge when it comes to devices. Those really tiny ones based on microcontrollers, well, there's not much we can do for them, but it, it wouldn't be that interesting in the first place. Because I, as I said, those programs are rather simpler. For the bigger stuff, ARM devices or anything bigger, it suddenly becomes more interesting because you have quite powerful specs, and then when it comes to tackling complexity, closure becomes really relevant. When you have multi-threaded programs connected to the network and that sort of stuff, handling plenty of different kind of I.O. And when it comes to using GPIO and I2C, well, today I was having some issues for the first time for years. <laughs> so that's it, Morpheus Law for the win. But usually it's pretty easy in the sense that you just write some bindings using Java and then that's it. What was harder is then when you have to talk to a specific device, like the sensor I, I have here, then you have to go through the data sheet and implement it. Whereas I, I would variously have found a C library, for example. So there is a trade-off between what Clojure can give you as a language and as an ecosystem, and the extra work you have to do if you really want to go 100% Clojure. And for the big stuff, well, the more I think about it, the, the more I can truly picture Clojure being used for example, for manufacturing, not just for processing data in the cloud, but really inside factories, for example. And so imagine you're on a Sunday morning drinking a, a cup of coffee, all is fine, and suddenly you get a call and there's a problem at the factory. It would be pretty sweet just to be able to connect to a remote REPL and start debugging this factory just like any kind of program. So, Basically, when it comes to smart devices of all sorts, Clojure can bring you the smart part. Clojure is the brain. I have written a guide some uh, time ago regarding the Raspberry Pi. I'm in the process of updating it for uh, any kind of devices. It will be updated in the following days. So feel free to check it out, of course. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.